Is it good for you? <laughs> I've had better. going to be talking about one of my favorite actors, Cary freaking Grant. If that is not his middle name, it should be his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> now, we did a review, required viewing of North Northwest, which is one of my favorite films, undeniably required viewing. <laughs> yeah, movies that end in very silly fashion and have no real plot or it anything Sure. It ends with a sex joke. I mean, any film from 1959 that ends with a sex joke, it tops of my, I can't say that, but what was your first time seeing Cary Grant in a film? Was it North Northwest? It was, actually. It was something, it was one of these things where, you know, like, my first memory of it is, is dad flicking channels and, you know, it was probably even the famous crop duster scene, right? You know, and, and, for some reason, he had me watch that, and then I had to go somewhere, you know, whether it was a basketball game in that day or whatever it was. But, you know, even then I thought it was interesting, although he makes some odd decisions like, why do you do certain things you do when you're in battle against a crop duster? I, I don't even know, but, you know. Uh, what, what would you do if you're in battle against a crop duster in the middle of an open field? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know. Here's the thing. What is it that crop dusters actually drop? I, I don't even know. Like, I, I think I would be more disturbed by a bird taking a poop on my head than I would be, you know, whatever that thing. I, I'm not an expert, but I believe that those were pesticides. Oh. So that's actually scarier than a bird doing what it does. And if I'm wrong about that, let me know. But that's what I think that crop dusters do. That's That's been my understanding at the very least. Well, then in that case, you know, here's an idea. Let's, you know, not stay in the field. <laughs> I, you know. Well, this has turned into a um, into a field crop dusting survival guide rather than our first. <laughs> yes. Well, and I had another random thought, too, here. So, you know, for all the jokes I make about golf not being a sport, one thing the pandemic has forced me to do because playing football or basketball is not safe. I've actually taken up golf in the past few weeks and something struck me like oh, lightning. Is crap. What's that? Lightning. Not yet, but don't make jokes. I am in Florida. I know. Um, but now all I can tell you is as stupid as it sounds, the legend of Bagger Vance, that whole speech about trying to find the perfect swing and all that makes perfect sense. I'm not going to twist it. That's still a crazy movie that's not really worth a lot of your time unless you really like Matt Damon. But I did under that, understand that speech a little bit better, I'm just going to say. Well, what is happening to you, Kyle? <laughs> My entire <laughs> life of knowing you, it's been you've been an anti-golf fight. Well, no, but I always knew it would be time when I was older and it was time to negotiate for business and stuff when I was successful. I mean, I'm older. Uh, yeah, so. You know, <laughs> what does that have to do with Cary Grant? Um, absolutely not. I think <laughs> Cary Grant played golf at some point in his life. I would play golf with Cary Grant. Uh, well, I, 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 yeah, um, I'd play badminton with Cary Grant. I mean, <laughs> that's a, now I'm trying to think if Cary Grant ever played golf, but nevertheless, in any of his films. <laughs> my first time with Cary Grant is actually kind of an interesting story. So it was about the time I first got uh, interested in classic films. I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but I, I felt that we should highlight it in a Cary Grant episode specifically. But uh, my father introduced me to Charlie Chaplin and I'm like, I didn't want to watch a, a black and white silent film, whatever. But, you know, I, I sat down, I, I watched it and I got such, I got a big kick. I, watching Charlie Chaplin changed, changed my life. So I started pursuing other older films. Eventually, um, I, I used to, I came across my parents Parents watching one of the original Pink Panther films, actually specifically the original with uh, Peter Sellers and David Niven. And David Niven, oddly enough, was the original top billed star 
of Pink Panther, not Peter Sellers, who played Inspector Clouseau and all the sequels would focus on him or family members, etc. Um, but I, I started pursuing David Niven's career and I came across films such as Guns of Navarone, Separate Tables and so on. Eventually, I came across a Christmas film called The Bishop's Wife, starring... Oh, Cary Grant and David Niven. I'm like, who is who's this guy with this with this strangely American slash English accent that you can place? Uh, so I started looking him up, and I'm like, oh, he's done a bunch of Hitchcock films. I was familiar with Hitchcock, Psycho. I saw the cover North and Northwest. I'm like, that's that's the guy that got chased in the in the field with the plane. It's like one of the most famous scenes in film history. So I sat down and watched North and Northwest, and pretty soon I was. Uh, um, a big Cary Grant fan, especially because in a lot of his roles, he's always had a lot of versatility. You can watch him in a dramatic role and it just tears your heartstrings apart. Or you can watch him in something absolutely hilarious, uh, such as bringing a baby or um, or the Philadelphia story, etc. Or if uh, you can watch him in a in a pre Indiana Jones esque type of adventure in films such as Gunga Din, which directly inspired uh, Temple of Doom, uh, if you if you see if you're a big fan of Indiana Jones, especially Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom, watch 1939's Gunga Din. It is shocking how much uh, of an homage Temple of Doom is to that original film. Um, it it is absolutely incredible. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got a few comments, Jim. You and David uh, Niven. I swear to God, <laughs> uh, Charlie uh, Velasquez. I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. Char Charade was mine. Charade is in my top five Cary Grant films. Uh, Cary Grant. Audrey Hepburn, Walter Matthau, James Coburn, George Kennedy. Holy crap! It's the best. Uh, and it's I'm not I'm not the first person to say this It's actually pretty much a it's practically a tagline of the film at this point. The best Hitchcock film that Hitchcock never directed. Such a great movie. I agree, Charlie. We'll uh, have to cover it. Viewing upcoming at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, the reason I didn't go s jump straight into charade and in, uh, in my first release of required viewings is it's one of those films where I just I. I I know the answer and I'll probably sit there and just gush about it for two hours with you just doing the Captain Picard face palm the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, you might actually be right. Sometimes that happens too. I mean, there are some required viewings coming out where I'm not so sure you were as right as others, but that's okay. That's what makes it fun. If we agreed a hundred percent, this would be a very boring show. <laughs> you know, I, well, I mean, listen, there are people who can agree with talent. I, I don't know who they are, but they can. We need to release a few more required viewings before we get to that conclusion. <laughs> uh, have, have you seen any other Cary Grant films beyond North Northwest? I mean, uh, uh, so a lot of my North by Northwest or, or Cary Grant fare, uh, you know, falls into the Hitchcock category, right? I mean, obviously, Charade Upcoming, you know, is, is one of the ones I'm looking forward to just on the pure basis of, of what's his word, curiosity, you know. I mean, we make jokes about me uh, saying that North by no, Northwest isn't required, but it's certainly recommended. I mean, it definitely gets the, it belongs in the museum uh, defense because, cause, and in fairness, Demos, we have not yet developed the it belongs in a museum um, uh, award because we were, relatively newer into the required viewing series. And what I would say is because, to your point, it's the foundation for so many other characters, right? It's 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 got elements of Indiana Jones in it. It's got elements of James Bond in it. And for that reason alone, it, on top of it being a Hitchcock movie, you know, it belongs in a museum. It's actually quite the other way around. Uh, the James Bond series itself acknowledged North Northwest as a big inspiration to the tone and feel. Uh, and North Northwest, in many ways, was a tonal blueprint for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, to, I mean, that, by Spielberg's own acknowledgments. Didn't I say that? I thought. No, no, that yeah, but the way you worded it, it was almost like it was the inverse. So I just, I'm uh, oh, no, specifying. Yeah. Oh. Make it clear, yeah. No, I'm 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 trying to point North by Northwest as the granddaddy that inspired the others. Yeah, no. If if that was unclear, 
let me be clear in saying that's not what I was saying. So if, if North Northwest is the only Cary Grant film you've seen so far in its entirety, and you mentioned the Hitchcock films and Jim Linehan joining us again, welcome Jim actually mentioned something. Uh, it was, uh, it was all right. I assume he's talking about charade. North Northwest was better. Same as to catch a thief, but that's my opinion. And Charlie, agrees to catch a thief was so good i can agree there ha 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 um yes uh, carrie grant did four hitchcock films he did suspicion he did notorious to catch a thief and he capped it all off with north northwest uh to catch a thief and notorious in particular are two of the best hitchcock films ever made notorious is I'm going to avoid the pun by and just say that it was incredible. Um, it's Gary Grant James playing James wait Bond. Wait You're avoiding the pun on this show. By the way, I want the record to show I've also sampled Father Goose. That was a good time. I enjoyed that thoroughly in and of itself. That was the second to last film, Father Goose. Um, before he did walk, don't run. But it, uh, I, I think that this actually is um, is a good spot for us to explore what future required viewings to do with Cary Grant. Uh, especially, I mean, you've had your first time. Now it's time for uh, for your second and your third, I guess. But at least for the full course meal, the. Um, like I said, some of some of the greatest films in cinematic history, going back, like I said, Bringing Up Baby, Holiday, uh, The Awful Truth, uh, a lot of films that yeah, I tend to like some of his smaller fare. One of the hardest films to find uh, of, of his filmography was the 1950 film called Crisis, where he it's a fairly serious film. Um, some some comedic relief but mostly serious so he's a brain surgeon that gets kidnapped in south america to perform brain surgery on a dying dictator it sounds ridiculous but it's actually quite riveting and it's one of those unsung gems in his career what did you hear about me that you're a tyrant that i ought to let you die they think i'm afraid to die aren't you me i'm only afraid to die badly why do they think you should kill me? Because I'm an American. Uh, they're stupid. Are they? Uh, to them, America means freedom. I'm American. You are a tyrant. Therefore, it follows I should let you die. I can see some theirs there. And, and listen, um, you know, I know it's trite, but like Mr. Blanding's dream house. Yes. Deserves its props, too. Um, so you've seen it. What's that? You've seen it. I've seen most of it, yes. It's another one of those things where my dad liked to flick ten channels too much, and then, like, you know, he would he would have it on the, alongside of, like, a game, uh, football game or something. So, like, well, now I've missed all this other part. You know, damn it. But, no, Mr. Blanding's Dreamhouse, listen, I could, I could definitely make an argument that that has the grandfather defense for a movie such as Office Space. Or something like that. I mean, yeah, sure. There are plenty of, you know, the money pit comes to mind, for example. Oh, the money pit is very much uh, a practically a remake of Blue Mr. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. You know, at least in that day, they were worried about, you know, not ripping somebody off. So at least change the title, stupid thing. They don't, you know, slink back and call it a reboot, right? <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, but I could argue it's a pre precursor to movies such as Office Space like that that take a situation like that and just go... And here's what happens. Here's a commentary on it, you know. Um, well, Charlie mentions, uh, what about Operation Petticoat? My dad loved that movie. Uh, yes, Blake Edwards, also the director of The Pink Panther. Um, Cary Grant, Tony Curtis, great comedy. And it is uh, on the list. We are planning at one point. I know this sounds ridiculous. At one point, we're going to have a month of... Uh, required viewings dedicated to submarine films. <laughs> uh, Operation Petticoats on the list, Hunt for Red October, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and a couple of other surprise uh, films. I mean, listen, you it sounds bad. There's even a joke out there that's saying people who read books about submarines are old or whatever. But I think you'll be surprised, folks, on how good a month you have in mind here if you're a classic movie film. I'm just saying <laughs> that would be an interesting, um, interesting uh, thing to pursue. What is the greatest submarine movie of all time? 
Oh, for goodness sakes. Um, see, part, part of me part of me wants to almost give the default win uh, to 20,000 Leaves from the Sea because it's based on the Jules Verne classic, and it is in its own rights a great, great film. But I think that that month might determine it because I'll be honest, Hunt for an October, uh, that is that – is, that that's golden competition. It's not even a shame, the fact that we have two such great films competing. Um, I mean – if you don't put that in the ring of this Royal Rumble, you're doing it wrong. And and some people agree here. Um, Charlie says, sweet. That's amazing. Jim says, hunt for October or das Boot. Uh, Stephanie says, 20,000 leagues under the sea. Charlie says, down Periscope. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. Yes. Yes, we are going to. Yes. That is on the list as well. Down Periscope. That's what I'm talking about. Someone came in there with down Periscope. Bless you. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I do want to stress as we close this segment that uh, if you're looking for um, one of the greatest actors in, in American cinematic history, uh, you could do worse than than Cary Grant. Uh, so many of his films are bona fide classics in American cinema and films that have in many ways continued to influence films to this day, in particular North Northwest, which I still consider to be the first true contemporary action film. Um, so much. Oh, absolutely fair point, man. Hey, listen, when you're talking about greatness in American cinema, I thought you were talking about Kelsey Grammer for a minute because we were talking down Bariscope. I didn't realize you were going full circle, so I'm back with you. I'll give you this. I cannot see Cary Grant doing as great as of a performance as Beast as Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> Props. But I can see him play Fraser Crane. Oddly enough. But, but hold on. Is this a pop quiz who it could have been addition? <laughs> Maybe. Cary Grant as Fraser Crane. I can see it. I can see it, but let me tell you why. Let me tell you where I think he'd be a better fit, right? I think he'd be better as Niles. The only issue I've ever had with Niles is his, his build is so very small. And, and, and granted, that calls for the part. I feel bad for remember not remembering the actor's name, but he does a great job, and the comedy is epic for that reason. But if if Kelsey Grammer and Cary Grant were acting opposite one another as Frazier and Niles, I really think that would be even better. You're thinking um, of, you're thinking of David Hyde Pierce as as yes, Niles. Man, thank you, Demos. Um, and and I think that dynamic would kick butt. Um, I think he's he's too intimidating and imposing a figure. To, to play the lanky Niles Crane. Although no, for some reason, I and I'm not suggesting this as, as, as my replacement for Niles, but for some reason, James Stewart jumped in my head. <laughs> uh, 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 now, Fraser. He would be great as Martin. By the way, you're the only guy I've ever heard call him James Stewart, but okay. Oh, uh, it, it depends. And early in his career, he was credited a lot as Jimmy. And then later, as his career progressed, he achieved esteem. He was credited as James. So, hey, listen, at some point, he was James Carey, too. But it was the opposite. Oh, he got more popular, he became Jim Carey. Cary Grant's original name, and it's, it, it's actually good that we're mentioning this in this episode, is Archibald Leach. That's awesome! His real name is Archie Leach, and they actually he mentions it in a joke in one of his uh, films. Um, uh, uh, um, oh my god, I can't believe it's slipping my head. His Girl Friday, great film in and of its own. That's probably, that's a required viewing film, as far as I'm concerned. But when I hear Archie Leach, I think of John Cleese in A Fish Called Wanda. Is that not his name? <laughs> I think so. I need to double check that. But if it was, it'd be a play on Cary Grant. Whoa. <laughs> and for those wondering, yes, I did just have a Bill and Ted moment. 